what we're going to be talking today uh, is about uh, ener energy management at, uh, at scale and a little bit on the pathfinding that, that myself and, and, and the team were doing in the network and edge division of, of, uh, of uh, Intel uh, in the CTO office. Um, so I'm going to skip the, the abstract, but you can access, uh, access, uh, access it through, through the um, through the, through the site, but uh, basically like what we will go is a little bit on the, the motivation of the, the work that I'm sharing here, uh, talk about what we call the energy proportional systems. Again, all the context, uh, the stuff that we're going to be sharing today is, is pathfinding in the, in the context of sustainability and, and energy from the network and edge division, and then uh, I'll go a little bit on the uh, closings and, and Q&A. So I don't know how much you guys are aware on what edge is and what, uh, uh, what probably in IoT domains like that you go from uh, small devices to down the data center. But basically what I wanted to share is just one slide on basically you see the different types of deployment models that we are facing from edge perspective, right? It's, it's traditionally like uh, we came like uh, when I was doing the PhD 13 years ago having uh, the, the grid computing, then everything became cloud and now we're expanding uh, back again into the into the more kind of highly distributed systems, and obviously the more farther you go to the to the edge, the more smaller devices you typically find, and and with uh, less less power and more uh, res uh, requirements, you know, well restrictions in terms of deployment model. What's one one is one thing to keep in mind. So we, I mean, we we've, we've been working on I think working on edge for like five to six years, and well, when all these passwords started. And I, I, lastly, I'm started to use the Edge Big Bang as a as a concept. Like basically, so like if you look 2016, uh, we were doing deployment of 50, 100 edges at most, and now real deployment models that we are uh, doing with uh, real customers that they go at scale, we're talking about hundred thousands of edge locations, right? So, what what this implies, right? So. If you look at the at, this, at the context of, of the current edge deployment models, so like we're moving, there's really uh, a trillion of of, of uh, um, uh, space in terms of the the the, the business aspect of, of of the edge, right? So there is a change in, a change happening uh, uh, worldwide, and but there's also like uh, uh, climate change is, is a fact that is happening, right? And that's something that no one can neglect. Uh, we're seeing that uh, you know uh, last. Uh, like floats happening last uh, last few weeks with uh, lots of impact uh, business but uh, economic but also like uh, persons and and like uh, from the human aspect right and and this comes with the with this inflect, inflection point that it's interesting to see how now we were coming from where sustainability was sort of a password and you know a lot of greenwashing I'm, i may say to something that is becoming like a, an imperative uh, for most of the companies, right? If you just go into the GSMA uh, report on sustainability, uh, like uh, from last summer, you will see like the 30 top telco companies are basically aiming uh, zero uh, deployments in, in 2030. And I'm going to get into the zero comment in, in fewer slides, but that's, that's becoming a reality. So um, what we uh, are looking into, like when you look at sustainability and energy efficiency and, and you look at the single point, like optimizing energy from, uh, from one, for example, one base station providing uh, 5G or 4G connectivity, it's one thing. But when we go at the scale that we are talking in the deployment models, the, the challenge is, is, is obvious, right? So from the, from the word that you will see here, so basically what we are proposing is what we call elastic systems and elastic infrastructure, which basically is about uh, uh, that you need to have your systems adapt to the to proportional to the demand that is happen for the for the services. Typically, like when when we do architecture, like especially I'm coming from the CPU uh, world, so you always look for the peak, right? That you want to size and make sure that you're going to deliver peak performance. But the reality is that if you look at most of the edge workloads, uh, and I put bet my salary that 80% of the workloads that we have uh, deployed in general, they have a stationary like behavior, right? So you'll have some time that is peak, but then you will have a lot of, of ballets or, or things that are changing. So the, the principle is, can we adapt the, the systems and, and the software and hardware to basically be capable to uh, 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 adaptively uh, do implement this proportionality that is needed? 
and we will we will show a little bit some uh, projection model just to give a little bit of sense on on, on numbers on how we could potentially change uh, um, gain by do implementing the, those elastic systems during during the presentation. So something I, I want to start. I mean, I want to um, kind of to set the context right on the three pil pillars that are behind these works. The first one is. Uh, I don't know how much you guys are familiar with uh, sustainability scopes. So there are basically three, three scopes. The first one is, is embodied carbon, like how much, for example, in, in, in Intel, how much carbon is associated to manufacturing chips, for example. The second one is on the, uh, like the operational, for example, like, uh, okay, I'm deploying a, a, a workload into a, or a system uh, that is, for example, doing video analytics for safety how much uh, that system is consuming in terms of energy. That's uh, uh, scope two. And uh, scope three is uh, the operational derived carbon. What that means is, okay, now I'm deploying a system and that system is, uh, this, that system is, is failing, right? So, um, give me a second, let me try to see if I can. Okay, if it pop up again, I'll, I'll try to deactivate the network. Uh, but, but basically the third one is, okay, I need to replace a system and uh, that means that uh, you know I, I have to have someone that goes there with the car, uh, doing the management, and that has some implicated cost on on, on the on, on carbon. So the, what you will see here, we're going to be focusing on scope two and scope three. And and when you look on the like one of the areas uh, that I think that from ecosystem and community perspective, uh, we need to look at it's on on the on how we account uh, carbon. And basically, being realistic on when we talk about zero carbon or carbon net uh, deployment, what that it means. Right? Because, I mean, if you ask me, I think it's very almost impossible to have 100% uh, uh, green or, or, or net carbon uh, architectures. But uh, so I think it's very important that we, we are kind of honest and, and, and as ecosystem, so we define the metrics on, on, on what uh, carbon means and, 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 and uh, and, and, and the zero or, or carbon uh, neutral. So the second pillar is on the green energy. So there is one interesting paper of, of Microsoft that that, uh, that talks about the myths around sustainability. And the second, one of the myths that they have is uh, uh, green energy for everyone, it's, it's, it's uh, possible. So this morning, this, morning, this morning we had a talk on the, on the grid energies and we know that the distribution of energy is a challenge and not everywhere is going to be enough compute for, uh, I mean, enough energy for driving the compute that is needed. But on the other side, the interplay of with the grid is very important because as, as the guys were showing this morning, in many situations you have peak of, of solar energy and if you are not using it, you have to throw it away. So what do we do on those scenarios? And the last pillar is, okay, so we are assuming the, the edge wing bank that I was talking about. So you have highly distributed systems. So when you have such distribution, how you are making use of the energy that is uh, distributed and, and map and match this with the compute demands that are needed for, for the edge workloads. So um, today, I mean, we, if you look a little bit on, on what, uh, there, there are some reference at the, in, uh, at the last part of the, on the backup of the slide, but basically from, from Intel perspective and in my division, so we are focused on, on multiple areas. Obviously the, the hardware is, is one of them, so we are looking at energy efficiency like from the silicon perspective, trying to have system, uh, like CPUs or GPUs that maybe are 30% uh, more efficient yeah, gen over gen with the process design and, and, and so stuff like that. We're doing a lot of work on, on cooling systems, try to understand if you deploy a system into, into the far edge, what is the best solution? Is air-based, is, is precision cooling, imagine what's the, 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 the best kind of technology there. And obviously like on the, on the software, software aspect, right? So it's, it's clear that, that you, you can decouple like the, the hardware and the software so you can have intelligent APIs from the hardware to manage and understand energy and power uh, map resources, but you need some intelligence on top of that software base that understands uh, how, how, how to use and, and, and manage the, those powers. And in this case, so we, for example, one of the examples is what is called intent driven orchestration that we are uh, providing to the, to the community and, and, and we participate also like in, in open source projects to kind of uh, facilitate the adoption of, the, of the, the hardware technologies that we have. So if you look here, um, that's where we are. And now we're gonna jump a little bit on the topic of the talk that is kind of the, the, the area that uh, I'm, I'm kind of interested on a, on a pathfinding or, or TR perspective. So 
what the the first principle uh, you know the, now I'm shifting a little bit from the from where we are in terms of a status quo into in, into what do we leave that that's the uh, that we need to do from from system design the first one the first need that we, we are basically working on two needs so the first one is about the the what we call energy proportional systems and basically I'm going to use the analogy like so we we are part working that's a uh, that's public information with a company called Thelnex that they are infrastructure owners and they are deploying uh, B2B and B2X services in the European corridor to kind of implement, uh, for example, safety use cases on the, on, on the road like uh, with video analytics. So what happens, right? So in this type of deployment models, uh, when, when you have rush hour, so, so you, you will have high density of, of traffic, so you'll have to process more uh, more objects in your video analytics pipeline. So uh, for the ones that, that, that you are not uh, experts in this area, so typically the, uh, this type of algorithms, the, the, the load that, that they require in terms of, of compute is proportional to the, to the objects that they need to process, okay? So now if you are in the rush hour between 12 and 4 p.m., so like you will need a Formula One car to, to process the, the information that it's, it's in, the, in the road itself, right? But now, you go into medium density and then uh, from 1 to 7 p.m. and you need a, a, a MotoGP car, a MotoGP uh, to do the processing. But now there's an accident, so your system has to react. You need the Formula One car back again to do the processing of, of, of the, that, that algorithm requires. But now you go into the low valley like 8 p.m. and onwards and you just need a scooter because maybe there are one or two cars that need to, uh, to be processed, right? So the, the, the key question here is, uh, I need a system that, that basically, in terms of the energy consumption, can work very efficiently when, it's, uh, when it, it has to operate as, as a Formula One car, but as well when it has to operate as a, as a scooter. So that's the first area that we want to address. And the second one is uh, the elastic time and, and space shifting, right? So uh, this morning, what the, the talk about the, 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 the energy grid was interesting because it was about managing the, the energy uh, distribution. But also, like you can think about that, uh, that you can also like elastically move uh, compute in the different edges depending on the energy availability in the different locations, right? So, uh, what we are looking in this area is, um, uh, like for example, in the previous example that I was talking on the corridor. So you may have a roadside unit that a given point of time is processing a video analytics service. Um, that is just this camera, right, and maybe identifying. Uh, uh, cars or identifying uh, accidents or objects that may uh, kind of become a, 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 a threat for the cars driving there. And but what happens is that you know the and this if you look on the on the related work that we have on the slide, you will see that the systems that we've been working with Senex, so they are uh, off grid, so they are with uh, solar panels. And what happened in, in a particular time of the day that maybe the the renewable energy ratio is 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 medium, so it's not that good, but guess what? You happen to have another guy that is close by to you, two milliseconds with 25 gig latency connection between this, uh, this base station or roadside unit and the other one, high energy ratio, so it means that probably it's getting energy that it's being thrown because it, it doesn't fit in. Uh, so the battery is fully charged, the compute is already satisfied with the energy, so maybe you're throwing like 100 watts in that, in that edge, right? So what you can elastically do is decide, okay, I can move this, uh, the service that is processing this, uh, this stream from, from the first uh, roadside unit into the second one. So that's, that's what we call the, the elastic uh, time and space shifting. So that's kind of the, these two uh, needs are the one that we're going to be talking uh, from the, for the rest of the, of the presentation. So um, uh, a little bit, so now if you recall, uh, when, when I was talking on the, on the, on the previous slide, right, so we, we had the, the uh, hardware and the, and the software on top of it. So when you look at the, and looking at traditional orchestration policies with Kubernetes and, and stuff like that, so now uh, a little bit uh, here I'm kind of depicting, okay, where, where we want to go into. So the, 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 the first area, it's a little bit of a, well, not super HR, but a, a little bit. Uh, so the first area that we want to look, it's on the bottom, on the hardware. So what we call the adaptive uh, uh, systems, and I'm, I'm going to go in through that. But basically what it means is, uh, traditionally when you see like uh, uh, hardware, like uh, hardware systems, like that have multiple GPUs, CPUs, NICs, and stuff like that, 
uh, or and they, they are provided by OEMs uh, partnered with us like Lenovo, whomever it is. It, it's just a single box that is, you can do some power management for the different resources, but that's it, right? You have what you have. So here, the, the hypothesis that we have is that you, you, can, really, you can really implement uh, this kind of level of, of uh, uh, mutable uh, systems that can uh, morph depending on, on the requirements, right? But obviously, like the second important aspect is if you want, uh, if you, you have systems that can change from a Formula One car to a, to a scooter, you, you need some intelligence, right? That, get, that tells you either how much, uh, when it makes sense to change from one st state to the other, and that maybe if you wanna have capacity planning, uh, you want to move warlords from A to, uh, to B, you need some level of intelligence that, that, that allows to do that, right? And basically here we're looking at, at federated uh, type of approaches, uh, like federated learning to kind of learn when you have highly distributed systems on how do they behave and try to derive, like for example, project like the, the likelihood of, of taking benefit of moving uh, uh, one workload from one place to another. And the last one, the last part is obviously on the, on the elastic uh, uh, orchestration policies. So like typically you have like, for example, Kubernetes that is managing one or multiple nodes within a cluster. But now when you go into the scale out systems that you have hundreds of thousands of nodes, so how you implement these elastic policies. Um, so let me, we'll, I, I will go a little bit on, on the different the three areas um, I'll, and I'll, I'll cover a little bit like the, the motivation, what we're looking into and provide some, uh, some first levels of, of numbers uh, on the prototypes that we, we've been doing. I'm, I'm gonna start on the, on the first, which is on the proportional systems. So let's, let's assume that uh, a system, right? So typically is uh, composed um, um, uh, a host that can be Xeon, can be AMD, can be whatever type of compute. Uh, now you have, here I'm, I'm gonna be using the IPU. IPU for the ones that you don't know, it's a infrastructure processing unit, which basically is, is a network card that has some level of compute like cores and, and some ASICs to accelerate kind of um, crypto float and stuff like that. But basically this is kind of another system that is connected into the, into the Xeon. So the question is now, let's say that you can have a system that you have something that is uh, Xeon or, or uh, an IPU system or it's uh, another core type uh, based of, of, uh, of uh, uh, SOC. And here what you see, it's, it's, a, it's a graph that it's very simple, so intuitive. So on the, on the y-axis, you can see uh, units of, of it's, it's kind of um, removed. Uh, I mean, we, we don't show the specific use case to make it generic, but basically on the y-axis, you see the, the units of work uh, per second per system uh, watts. And then on the x-axis, the amount of, of uh, units per second that, uh, of work that, that a particular te te compute technology can, can drive. So now, if you look more on the, here on the, on the right side of the picture, you see, okay, so if, I, if I'm on those situations when I need a Formula One car, yeah, sure. I mean, I had zero, seven uh, units uh, of work uh, per second per, per watt in a, in a Xeon system, which is, uh, it's good. But now, if I'm going into those situations, like when I go from 600 to something that is between uh, zero and, and 100, now in this situation, it's more and more effective to move my workload and execute that in, in this small SOC that it's, it has less uh, capacity, but it's more effect, efficient in terms of, of energy. So this is, uh, this is kind of the, the, the first principle that we're using in, the, in, the proportion, in these proportional systems. And, 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 and when you look at the, uh, from um, uh, architecture perspective, so like this is real data that is, is extracted from, uh, uh, from a database in, a, in UK that has all the then traffic uh, uh, for the different roles uh, over the last uh, 10 years, so you can get it and basically extrapolate uh, that uh, this load, uh, load graph where basically you can see with respect to the peak load uh, that you will have at a given point of time, that's kind of your design point that you, you need in order to keep the, the, the uh, service level objective of the, of the workload. How, um, how with, with respect to that peak, uh, the percentage that you have on average to utilize through the day, right? So, and, and here, if you can see, uh, like uh, you have like the low valleys, uh, incremental peak, uh, low uh, start to go down and then you go into the low valley again, right? So now let's say uh, to combining to what I just said, so maybe now if you have this system that is uh, proportional and now 
on a peak um, you are running the, the, C, the service into the into the Xeon or or AMD or the, the kind of the peak uh, the, the, the high-end part of the system now maybe uh, you go into this kind of low valley and if you have uh, silicon or CPUs that are that can implement this proportionality and switch off part of the of the of the SOC now you still uh, use the, the Xeon as, as your compute engine but now if you go into the low valley you can power off the Xeon and move the, the service into this in, in this case into the network card right and and you go from system or a system that is consuming 250 watts into something that is 120 watts and you go something that is sub 50 watts so now uh, just to to give a little bit of of a of sense on, on on potential implications when you go in, into a deployment model. So now let's uh, it is a modeling assumption, so more more on the back on the backup. But basically, using uh, this uh, load that I was showing graph into the previous slide, uh, getting the, the the current cost in terms of energy for, per kilowatt hour, and assuming a deployment model where you have about forty two thousand sites. So what potentially savings you can have if you can implement those elastic systems. Right, so uh, this this uh, this graph basically what it's showing is the amount of uh, million U.S. dollar uh, savings that you can have uh, in the different parts of the of the of the day. Uh, the, so the blue the blue lines are uh, million U.S. dollars. I'm using dollars because I'm American company. So if I use euros, uh, the guys uh, get confused. So these on the commas versus dots. It's an important aspect when you present. A slide, but basically, jokes aside, so you have the U.S. dollar saving per year, and then the the, the orange is about the millions of uh, kilograms of CO2 that you can save per year, right? So just with this proportionality, uh, like you can, uh, like when you go through the year, like potentially you can, and, and again, this is a modeling, right? So even it's 10 percent of these or 20 percent. That's this huge number. So just for a deployment model with 42,000 uh, 42, edges you can save about uh, 70 million US dollar of energy per year. So there's a, 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 a obviously a, a business uh, reasoning behind it, but you can uh, save 140 millions of, of CO2 emissions, right? Something I have pending is, is to translate that in how many airplanes it, it uh, because it's prob probably a, a, way, a way to get a perspective, but this is, this is a lot, okay? And so this is kind of the kind of a projection model, but we, we are implementing the, the policies that I just talked about in, a, in, in real hardware and systems. So what we have done up to now is uh, we have a, an IPU that is this small uh, network card that I was talking connected into a Xeon. So what we have done is in this IPU, we're implementing the control plane and, and telemetry from the whole system. So you have a small uh, brain that goes into this small SOC that monitors the workload, monitors the, the system, and dynamically can uh, move the, the, the workload from, from the main host into the, into the network card and can apply this level of uh, kind of uh, proportionality that I was talking about. So if, if you look uh, on the, this is uh, the prototype, and, and again, with the current, with the current technology or the current implementation that we have, we can't put the whole Xeon and the whole, uh, because there's, some dependencies. So, if I put the Xeon in, 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 I should I put I put it off. Now the IPU is not working properly. So there are some things that we we are uh, working on. But basically, like we have a first level of, of the of the prototyping where like uh, we are monitoring. You can see here that uh, we we have like uh, it's a real video analytics workload where we can go uh, depending where it's processing like 32 objects, uh, 15 or one objects. We, or one object in, in, the, in the region of interest, so it can go from this system that is 240 to 160 to 110. And obviously, this uh, and in this 110, so we are moving. I'm sorry about that. So in this 110, we are moving the executing the workload in, in this small SOC. But the, the concept is really like to have this adaptive uh, system. And and if like uh, and just to uh, compare with uh, the kind of modeling that we did. So now here you can with the current uh, prototyping that I was just sharing. So what we have done is this is a real execution of the of the workload modeling the 24 hours. And, and basically what you can see is that, that the shape is is very similar, right? So this is the, the blue line is the 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 the, um, the, the amount of uh, uh, savings that, that you get uh, through the day. Uh, now the, the orange is the typical energy consumption that you would see in a, st in a standard type of uh, system architecture. And then the orange, uh, the yellow is the 
power that is consumed by by the xeon and the blue and the and the green one is i and the the the, the gray one is the one that is consumed by the by the network right so you can see i mean with the current and the the team is showing this uh, this 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 week in the innovation event intel innovation event in, in san jose but that's uh, something that is with the current technology we can aim 30 percent already savings right so now think about if i can truly like implement the the the, the, the these proportional systems and i can truly like shut off uh, the, the, the system and keep the workloads into the IPU, like this 30% uh, grows. So um, the, 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 second, the second part is on the, on the observability, right? And, and here I don't, I don't have any performance data, but basically uh, what we are doing uh, here is, um, okay, so now I, I have these uh, proportional systems. Okay, so how, how, how do I basically use them, right? Because the example that I showed is, is just one location, but if I have uh, 30 or 100,000 locations, I need to really understand like whether, like for example, the previous slide, I, I was not assuming that I have systems that they are connected into solar panels. Now maybe I can apply this propor proportionality to the systems that are using grid uh, energy or that they are low in, in solar energy, but if I have a system that has excess of energy, I can basically move my load into that and apply, and I don't need maybe to apply proportionality, right? So to do that, I mean, obviously you need to have like some level of observability that helps you to decide whether I have a workload and I need to apply proportionality local to the system, or I need to move this workload into another place because the likelihood of uh, having more energy efficiency into the other place is much better. But also like I need some intel intelligence that tells me like whether I need to switch from one place to, the, I mean, uh, from one state to the other, because obviously when you switch from the Xeon to the, um, uh, move a Xeon to the, from the, uh, a workload from the Xeon into the IPU, that has some implications in terms of like, it's a stateful application, I need to resume, I need to restart. Uh, you have to pay some tolls that to me, to make that change. So the, the second area that, that we are looking, it's really on the observability. And here, for example, you can see like one of the models that we were uh, training in a, in a federated manner, like that's uh, similar to what the guys were showing this morning is, okay, I have like uh, 60,000 uh, off-grid sites that have uh, solar energy. So, okay, I can uh, collectively train the, the data. I mean, the, the data that I get on the current solar energy and predict what's gonna come into the next 24 and 48 hours. And what we are looking here is also like looking at a concept that is what we call like uh, elastic AI training, which is okay. Now, I mean, if if I'm if I need to train models at the edge, and it's costing me 20% of energy, uh, and I'm uh, and I'm saving 10%, okay, better stay at home, right? So, what we are looking into here is okay. So I have excess of energy in in this highly distributed system, so I can use this excess of energy to train those models. So basically, I'm, I'm not kind of adding penalties into the carbon emission because I need something more as much. So that's, that's another area that we, we're uh, kind of focusing on. So the, the, the last part is on, on the, on the, on the space, and, uh, space and, 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 and kind of this uh, energy uh, time and space shifting. Uh, uh, and basically, so here very, I mean, now uh, connected to, to the slide that I, uh, that I shared early in the beginning, it's, it, it's very intuitive, right? So what we are implementing is uh, local uh, control plane policies that are monitoring the, the, the workloads, the performance that they have and the energy, and basically uh, they are working with this uh, system energy optimizer to kind of adapt the power based on the, on the application requirements. And, and this with call, I mean this typical closed loop that you have on observe and enact, right? And now um, we we were implementing this uh, global intelligence where basically now if you have uh, uh, like that you have this federated uh, orchest well we're looking into federated orchestration policies and I'll, I'll share a little bit uh, what some of the work that we're doing with one of the partners but basically like getting all these uh, observability stacks that I was sharing like one stack uh, one slide ago and uh, feeding that back into a distributed orchestrator and basically getting telemetry from the infrastructure as well and basically in this case so if I have like two edges that say yeah uh, maybe the, the the way that we're implementing this now is h1 may say yeah look I'm the, the likelihood that I have to, you know, to be not effective in, in terms of energy is, is high. 
and now you have another side that is uh, sending back into the this federated orchestration a this is my uh, energy capacity planning in the next 24 hours or 24 minutes or whatever it is and i have intelligence from the infrastructure that is telling to this global um, energy manager on, on how the network is behaving so now this guy can factor to all these three elements and decide to move the world right um, so in in this case uh, what we're assuming is obviously you can't move uh, any warlord to any place right you have some constraints you have reliability you may have distance you may have cost right so just to um, just to give us a little bit of, of pressure on, on what we can achieve so what what we have done just uh, like um, on the previous slide, I was talking on the energy proportional system, but from the modeling perspective is, okay, let, let's assume that I have, I can federate like uh, 10 units of, of edge uh, appliances, right? In the very same example that I just shared in the, in the previous one, 42,000 edge locations, assuming I have 40% uh, of the locations that they are uh, uh, based on, on off-grid, like, uh, like uh, solar panels and wind turbines type of waste energy. And here, what you can see in the in, in the second graph is this is uh, real data with uh, from one of the partners that we are working with. That basically it's it shows like uh, it's a little bit of a, a nature, but basically what you guys can see here is uh, through the day the 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 blue uh, the blue uh, bars is the amount amount of energy that you have into the battery of that system, and then the orange line it shows you the irradiance that you have from the sun uh, from the sun at that particular. Uh, hour of the day. So what you can see here in this in this area here is that you have some energy that is coming uh, from the sun. You ba your batteries are full. So any uh, any watt that you are not using from this uh, uh, from this orange line that you are not using is wasted, right? So what we are uh, assuming is that um, uh, with this model and, and that we can group by, for example, edge ten uh, the edges uh, with with the groups of ten. So how is the sa potentially savings that you can have? Just, just to get a, a, a feeling on, on how, how, how much we could add on top of this uh, proportionality, right? So if, if you look at this, uh, the modeling that we, we're doing here, it's like you, you can increase like substantially more than uh, almost like 10% on the, on the energy and cost savings if you apply these energy policies. So if you start starting up, adding up all these things, when you go at scale, these numbers are, are, are substantial, right? And, and again, this is not an Intel thing. So this is a, this is an ecosystem kind of. I believe it's Intel has something to, to do with it. But to, to make this this uh, this uh, kind of uh, large scale policies, we, we need it's a, it's an it's an ecosystem uh, work. Um, so in in this case, um, just to get a little bit on on the type of implementations that we are doing. So I talked uh, a little bit on this um, capacity to have something that is monitoring uh, the, the, the warlords and do this kind of elastic management on what we call intent driven orchestration. And, and basically on top of, now, now if you recall, I was talking here, yeah, I have like three states. One state is uh, I'm running on the, on the Xeon. The second state is I'm still running on the Xeon, but I kind of uh, try to switch off part of the Xeon. And, and the third stage is uh, I move into, into this small SOC. So we have something that is called intent driven orchestration that when you are in, a, in this uh, still into the high end Xeon and because you are not in the low end, not on the high end, something that looks, uh, monitors the workload and based on that adaptively tries to switch off parts of the, of the Xeon using the, the SST, which is a technology that allows you to do the, the, the power management. And, and basically what, what you can see uh, here is, is um, if you, if you look a little bit on, on intent driven orchestration, one of the interesting parts is, is uh, how it works. We don't ask the, applica the application to say, eh, eh, um, run, run the work, I, I don't know, the course at 800 megahertz, 1200 or whatever, because typically applications are not aware, they, they don't really understand how we are messing up with the hardware underneath. So the, the way that we are working this out is you have the application is telling into the orchestration layer that we have here, this control, this local scheduler saying, hey, I need to do like 10 frames per second to do my job, right? Because that's typically something that the application domain expert knows. Like when we work with uh, companies that they do uh, like uh, B2X use cases for safety, they typically tell us, hey, for a particular camera to identify that there's an accident, I need to do minimum 10 frames per second. Okay, thumbs up. So we incorporate that into the into the CRD or the, the YAML file uh, manifest on the Kubernetes or uh, or Docker. 
Now, what the application also, we provide some APIs so that the application as it, uh, it gets deployed, so it does to, the, to this guy, I'm getting uh, 12 frames per second, 15, 50, uh, 8, 5, whatever it is. So with this intent driven orchestration, it's gonna be adapting the system to keep, try to keep as much as possible the, uh, the application throughput to the service level objective that it has in runtime, but always trying to keep the minimum as low. And here, what you basically can see is uh, there are four bars, right? So the, the here on the on, on the most uh, left, so you see, hey, uh, I'm, I go full speed, I don't, I'm running in performance mode, I'm not doing any, uh, any type of uh, uh, smart management on the, um, on the on on the on the power of the compute. The the second one is called is called balance perform, which basically it's it's uh, it's still I uh, start to look at this SLO that I was talking on the application, but uh, trying to keep the SLO like 20-30 percent above the target SLO uh, to to be in between. Like uh, it's like no, I'm not being super strict, but also I'm not like throwing the uh, I mean, ex uh, spending a lot, lot of energy into the into the world or wasting a lot of energy. And, and the last one, which is balance power, which is okay. Now I'm going to look uh, using this intent driven orchestration, so really getting into the trying to get close into the SLO and, money, uh, and, and minimize the, the power consumption, right? So in this case, uh, obviously uh, here in the in the here you see the the power that is consumed by the by the system, and here you see the the latency that is experienced by the by the workload in this case uh, kind of safety use case on video analytics and and here in the green line you see the the line on the slo right so anything that is above this green line is not acceptable anything that is uh, above it's always good right so the the lower the the better so here like if you look like the this balance power which is close into the slo uh like kind of a threshold so it it's actually giving 40 percent of energy savings right so now, if, if I'm connecting all the different pieces, right? So now you have like systems that can be proportionally uh, that can adapt. And now, uh, when I go, I have some telemetry that is telling me how system and the workloads will behave. And now I go into the local uh, orchestration and I do the the kind of uh, uh, monitoring the workload. And when I'm running uh, the the workload into the Xeon, I can. Uh, manage the power to keep the SLO. And now the, the last part that is missing is, okay, so now if I go, uh, I need this, uh, I have local, I need the global control loops. So here, um, what um, I'm, I wanna share is a little bit the, the work that we're doing with a company that's called Nearby Computing that is uh, is based in, in in Spain and it's a spin off of Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So here we are working with these guys to basically see when you look at this, uh, and we don't have performance data yet, hopefully the, the next time we present the, the work we will be will be able to show some more details, but basically, like uh, what we are doing is implementing these these APIs between the between this this local uh, uh, orchestration policies and this federated orchestration, right? And here the the, the goal, and and that's a little bit uh, on on the the us for or the for the ecosystem in general is if we are in start implementing this type of policies. So what are the APIs that we need to define between the different components that we have into into a software system stack, right? So we talk about power management, we talk about telemetry, we talk about local orchestration, we talk about federated orchestration. And it's obvious that when you go into deployment, you may have to take pieces from different parts of the of the of the ecosystem. So agreeing on, on how those APIs look like the semantics so that we can stitch things together is, is something that is, is gonna be really really required. So uh, just uh, uh, maybe to, to close, right? So I, I think that uh, a little bit on the, uh, on the, there are four, four areas that I, I believe that are interesting from, the, from, from this type of, of work is, uh, I think that the standardization and, and kind of uh, ecosystem work is, is very important because like when you go across the different solutions that we have in the ecosystem, not only Intel, like all the partner, I mean, uh, today, this morning, we, they talk about 30 different uh, software initiatives for, for green, from, for to do energy management, right? So do we really have uh, an understanding on, on what are the standard APIs? How do we hook things together and, and try to do something more uh, kind of, uh, common, not common, but a language that the different stacks can, can talk uh, in a consistent manner, there is like some uh, European initiative like Camera or like uh, some of the GSMA 
uh, efforts that have been driving uh, standardization in other areas of edge computing, I think that, that sustainability requires, requires uh, one of them. And the second one, which is on the, uh, I think, I mean, maybe it's not the, because AI is a password, but I, I truly believe that AI can help us a lot. And for example, areas that we are looking into is uh, uh, today we, for when we do orchestration, so we were usually uh, using our uh, kind of handcrafted rules to decide uh, uh, happens A, B, or C, then do C, then do D, right? But why the systems can learn themselves on how to apply, apply orchestration? So these ideas that we are kind of starting to look to see if we can use LLM models that they can derive automatically the what are the best uh, orchestration policies in different in different deployments, right? I mean, if you look at, the, again, the challenge here is the scale, right? You, there is no single, like, one size, one size fit all. So we really need to have systems and, and policies that can, can learn them, themselves. And I, honestly, uh, knowing the state of the art today on the, on the AI wall, I, th I mean, maybe I'm, I'm being too optimistic, but I think that, that there is a lot of, of potential here. And now, the, the other uh, two aspects, so one is on the, I think that on the, on the scope, so I think, um, uh, like, I think that a lot of work that needs, can be done in, into, into, into sustainability and, and carbon emission, I think, Typically, we always think about energy as, as the main driver, but there are lots of things. I mean, I'm not an expert on, on energy, but you know, anytime that you put hardware in a place, like from solar panels or whatever is there, like, okay, what, has the, what are the implications of, of having that system there? Or like, I, I think that we, we really need to have a mindset where we kind of honestly look at all the, all, all the final solutions and the implications, not only on the energy or, or the hardware that you have there, but all the all full chain, right? And there is very inter uh, interesting work happening into the ecosystem on uh, kind of uh, uh, all the blockchain and, and kind of traceability of things, which I believe that the, the community is doing doing awesome work. And the last one, which is on the attestation, right? So I, I truly believe that uh, we need something that that as as you know, I'm I'm seeing tons of so probably like you guys, lots of reports like yeah. This company, I'm saving 40,000 CO2 emissions, and and it's like, okay, what what do you mean by that, right? So how how you prove the that you are really do making a change, right? So like honestly, like for my my kids, I really obviously Intel is my job, but <laughs> I'm really caring is about what's happening, right? So we need mechanisms so that when we are saying yeah, I'm saving X or or Z, or Z, that can be attested. Like I don't know exactly the solution, but that's something. That, that needs to be, uh, I mean, it's, I, I, in, my, in my opinion, it's, it's very important. So uh, that's it. I think we have a couple of more minutes for q and I know I did throw lots of things uh, for like 45 minutes, but hopefully some of the things made sense. So questions? In your scenario, if you had like a, the crash and then like you have to react, have to react quickly to the, to the crash, would help you, have you tested so that's that's a good question. So we we test we have tested it like no, uh, so the typically like, like the the requirements that we have in terms of latency is that when an event is detected like you have hundred milliseconds to do something. So now uh, with the current implementation that we have, we can react in in twenty thirty milliseconds. So we are within the boundaries. But the question is if we go way more aggressive. And I'm not putting the system in, in C state, like really I'm putting the system off completely, how, how much I can do, right? So I, I think that all the, um, like uh, if, if the current state of the art, I think that it's, it's possible to, to do those things. The one, one, caveat, one caveat though, I think that uh, you have to cheat a little bit. What I'm, what I'm, what I'm gonna say here is, like for example, if, if you have like something, this workload that is, uh, uh, acting th that needs to do something, let's say uh, there's an accident happening and this workload needs to do that uh, within 100 milliseconds. So what we are doing now is that workload is into the system sort of in a sleeping state, right? And then you have another sort of uh, workload running into the IPU that says, hey, we have to wake this guy up and, and this guy have to, yeah, has to react, right? But to have the, uh, having the, uh, this workload in, in, in kind of a sleeping is not at, at, at zero cost in terms of energy, right? You have the RAM state, you have the, some, some incurred cost. So that's something that, I mean, uh, we hopefully will change and 
and looking at really like that you may have the workload like maybe in the IPU to some level of processing and studying that into the Xeon, then that's more work to be done there. But I, I think honestly, like technology-wise, it's, it's doable. And again, it depends on what are the latency requirements. If you have, like there are some deployment models like industrial that you do your, la like the latency maybe it's in the millisecond or microsecond, there maybe you don't have anything to do in this type of use cases. But in general, I think that we, I mean, we, latency-wise, you're okay. Any any other question? <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Um, you have the all-day infrastructure. It looks like the most fast running main application is you know uh, all the data that is saying that you know it's in the cold. Uh, are you planning to actually kind of compare application or it's for the entire time? Uh, so uh, now uh, it, that's interesting because if you look at the the telemetry that we're having in the latest generations of the, okay, so let me let me step back for a second. So yes, the answer is yes, you, you, you can report the, the telemetry power consumption per application. There are There is some great work happening, for example, on eBPF. Uh, there is, I mean, I, I recommend you guys, if you wanna look at the carbon, uh, is the hot carbon uh, conference. There are lots of good papers in there in the last, so, so we're in the, in the committee and, and there are like some really good papers. One of them actually talks about the eBPF and, and using the, the kernel telemetry to kind of estimate the carbon per, per application. So there is something al already there. Sometimes like the, well, uh, so you can do that. One of the questions that still I think needs to be solved is really when you report carbon, like how much is accurate, right? Because like uh, you're getting some telemetry from the hardware and extrapolating your carbon consumption, but I'm not 100% sure that we are really doing this, this in, a, in, in, in the level of detail that or depth that needs to happen. Okay, so thank you, and I know it's the last one, so thanks for coming. Now you can go and have beers and enjoy Bilbao, which is a very nice, nice city, so thank you.